If you would look with me, please, to the Gospel of Mark. Mark is the short little Gospel right after Matthew. There's a parable in Mark 4, starting in verse 3. And it's called the parable of the sower, it's called the parable of the soils. And I think that this parable needs to be foundational to our outreach efforts, to our prayers, because it explains in very simple terms uh, how the world works and what sort of things we come against. And it starts by saying that there was a sower sowing seeds, and in this picture, apparently the way that it is, is there was a guy with a bag of seeds, and he'd reach in, and he'd grab a handful of seeds, and he'd just fling them. And wherever they went, it's where they went. And some landed on the road, some landed on rocks, some landed on thorns, and some landed on good soil, And only the good soil is the one that grew. And then when Jesus is alone with his disciples, uh, he tells them the secret, which because this is an old, old story, many of us already know the secret, and that is that the seed is the word of God. And when we went out and put door hangers out, that was not the word of God, but a pathway to the word of God. It was an offer to the word of God on that thing. It told them where the church was, how to contact us, and what we believe. And we didn't pre-qualify the houses that we went to. If it was the next house, you got a door hanger. That's how it worked. Walked back and forth, up and down the streets, whatever streets were on that road, got a door hanger. And if somebody was... uh, Outside, there was a lady getting groceries out of her trunk when I was doing it, so I had an opportunity to invite her to church and ask her if she went to church and that kind of conversation. Now, some people will receive that, and they will say, well, I've, I've, I've known church, I, I've, I know what church is all about, I don't want anything to do with church, and they throw it away, and don't even read it, don't even read both sides, two sides to these things. And that person is like the road, because they don't even think about it. Before they even give it a thought, Satan comes and goes, nah, it's not for you. Now that person didn't become a road, if you will, overnight. That is a person who has been hurt and who has been beaten up, perhaps, by Christians or people in general perhaps having a very broken or abused family, therefore they don't trust people and don't trust church people because we're all hypocrites, they would say. Then you have some seed that falls along the rocks and those people go, yippee, Jesus Christ, and they accept with joy. So the Bible says they accept with joy, but there's no root. And when life gets tough, perhaps they lose a job, perhaps it's true persecution. They say, this is not for me, and they leave. Never saved, heard it, liked it, tried to become a Christian in their own strength. And then the thorns are people who can't really detach from the world. They get the offer for Jesus Christ, and they go, yeah, that's good, but I'm not going to give up my drinking, or I'm not going to give up my gambling, or I'm not going to give up uh, my workaholism. I'm, I'm, I like what the world is offering me, they would say. And the Bible even says they're, they're deceived by the offer of riches, that the world is, is going to give them something great, and they're deceived by that, and they weigh that as more important than the gospel. And so they just turn their back perhaps not as radical as the road, perhaps they will come to church a couple times, but it is a leaving the gospel over here because my worldly pursuits are much more important. And then you have good soil, which hears the gospel, says, yes, it's true, gets into their heart, Holy Spirit comes in, 
and they grow 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 and and we will see that person in heaven. And you can take, and I think you can take this as gospel, if you will, that you can see all four of those types of hearts in the world today. That when we witness either handing things out or talking to somebody at the grocery store or talking to a co-worker, when we witness, we will come across one of these four types of hearts. It's called soils because everybody was a farmer back then, but it's really a heart condition. You either have a hard heart like a road or you have a very protective heart like rocky or you have a very entangled heart like thorns, or you have an open heart which will accept the gospel. And so when we witness and when we share and when we pray for things, we will come against opposition. And the opposition will will be one of these four things in some way or another. And it may be a mix. I think you can have a rocky, thorny thing. You can have people that are really... Uh, against being hurt, but they like worldly stuff, and so they're doubly pushing against the gospel. And when it comes to the soil, and it doesn't say this in the, in the gospel of Mark, I think Jesus just wants them to figure it out, is that if I'm talking to somebody and it's clear they're, they're into worldly pursuits, And we've had people over the years come to this church and stop coming. And when I've asked them, their their candid answer is they didn't want to change. And so they're looking at the gospel as a set of rules that they have to keep in their own strength. And they don't want to do that because they don't want to change. They like the way their life is now. And that's a misunderstanding of the gospel. And you may find rocky soil and and thorny hearts that just misunderstand the gospel, that they've, they've come at church and they've come at reading books and perhaps they're watching... The, the, the evolution stuff on the Discovery Channel, and they're, they're getting confused as to how the world is put together. And we don't necessarily, in the time limit and with our level of understanding who they are, know the exact words to say. And so the gospel doesn't connect because it doesn't answer their questions. And that's not a bad thing. Okay, we, we only are carriers of the gospel. We are only couriers of the truth of God. We do not carry a baseball bat and beat it into them. We are couriers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we offer it. We are offerers of the gospel of Christ, and they have the opportunity, if they want, to take it. But as the word of God moves according to Mark 4, it does go out everywhere. And it hits all sorts of people. And we just may be bringing it to this one person or that one person. But soil and hearts don't stay the same forever. As long as a person is still breathing and is still on this earth, a thorny heart has an opportunity to become good soil. A rocky heart has an opportunity to become good soil. A road heart, a hard heart, has the opportunity to become good soil. And we cannot do that. God is the creator of soil. God is the changer of soil. God created every heart that exists out there today. And God can change every heart that exists out there today. And so when we talk about persistence of prayer, the number one thing we need to be persistent about is about the salvation of those we know. Perhaps we know a family member. Perhaps we know a neighbor. Perhaps we are just aware of the billion unsaved people in China 
or those who are under uh, false religious rule in Iran, places where we do not know their names, but we, we know for a fact that false teaching is being put out by the government and there are unsaved people there. And so we can, we can pray for those in China. We can pray for those that we know by name. And we keep doing it. And we keep doing it. And people have asked me, uh, one person said, I've been praying for, for a relative for 25 years and they still haven't accepted. Do I stop? And the answer is, of course not. You keep praying until you can't pray anymore. In other words, the Lord has taken you home. Or until it doesn't matter anymore because they have passed away. As long as both are still alive and breathing, praying for the salvation of somebody until that last moment. And as the story was, even through the, the confusion of dementia, God can reach in and clarify the mind and change the heart and get people saved in any situation. And we say, well, they're warehoused away or they don't understand anymore, but we can still pray for, for those that do not seem to be responsive for salvation. And I think when we get to heaven, we will see people that we had no idea they were hearing what we were saying. And they may come up to you, you may find them, and you can reminisce, and you can support one another, and you can be friends now for all eternity, because you prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for somebody, and God finally moved. And so when we come to the Gospel of John, John is done with his signs and miracles section. The last two verses of chapter 20. John says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And if you consider that, you would think that to be a logical statement, that there's no biography that is out there that tracks everybody or a person every minute of every day of every word they said, of every meal they took. John is giving the high points, and he says why he picked these. But these are written so that you may, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So it would be great if the Gospel of John was some sort of magic potion that we could just force people to read and if they'd read it, they'd get saved. But even John, walking with Jesus and, and believing as he did, said, these are written that you may, that it still becomes an offer, that it still becomes a proposition to you, that if you read the Gospel of John, you see in the print an offer to become saved. And because of this, because we have this purpose statement, we are very on the ball as churches that this is a summary of the Gospel of John is the number one tract. That if you go to any Bible bookstore, they will have 20 different versions of the Gospel of John in little pocket-sized things so you can hand them out. We don't do that with Obadiah or Joel or Matthew. We do it with John because John said, this is why I did it. And this is why it's going to work. And so we believe, and we believe correctly, that if I give you a summary of the Gospel of John, and you read it with an open heart, that God can change your heart, and you'll get saved. That's how we view the Gospel of John. And it's a true way to view it. And so when we look at how John formed his Gospel when we look at what he chose through the power of the Holy Spirit to put in there, he says that there were many things that Jesus did, but John picked seven. And he picked water into wine, healing the official son, 
healing at the pool of Bethsaida, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, man, healing the man born blind and raising Lazarus from the dead. And people have looked at these seven miracles. And interestingly enough, John does not consider as a miracle or a sign the resurrection of Jesus Christ which is fine, he doesn't have to, but that's the biggie, that if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead and prove that he was risen from the dead, then we're just wasting our time. But he gave seven miracles that Jesus affected while he was alive. And if we look at that list, we can come up with, with various ways that, oh yeah, I see how that proves Jesus' power over this or power over that, power over nature. And many books have been written by people going for their PhD on, on what each one means. And we don't e even necessarily have to know that data. Just knowing this list and getting a sense that Jesus Christ is taking care of physical needs, he's taking care of health needs, He's going to people who need them. He's feeding 5,000. He's healing a man born blind, which it says in the Gospel of John in chapter 9 that nobody since the beginning of time has healed a man born blind. And that's still one today, is that if you're born blind, that's it. Medicine cannot do anything for you. And that is why the man who was healed immediately worshipped God. That miracle specifically is seen as something that only God can do. That only God can heal sight that was never there. Even today we can give hearing back to those who are born deaf. We can give taste back to those who were born without any taste buds. All the senses... We can fix if somebody is born without them, but the eyes baffle us. We can kind of fix eyes when they kind of go bad after age. But somebody born without seeing capability, we don't know how to do anything with that. And Jesus did. And then raising Lazarus, we do bring people back moments after they die. Lazarus was dead for four days. Uh, that's a biggie. Nobody's done that since. Nobody's raised after four days. Uh, Jesus, of course, spent three days in the tomb. And John is saying, you look at this list, you study this list, you're going to come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing in him, you may have life in his name. So the offer is, you are declaring Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah sent by God, the Son of God, He is divine, and that when you believe that, you then enter into the, the path of eternal life. It isn't just something you nod to and go on with your life. It isn't something you add to your life. It replaces your worldly pursuits. And if we look at this as a, as a witnessing tool, as a witnessing opportunity, and, and I don't really see people knocking on doors and saying, do you realize Jesus healed a man born blind? We don't really come at it that way. We try to figure out where people are at and move Jesus into their lives based on their needs. But it's good to know the power of God and be convinced in your heart that any problem that is being presented to you, that God can take care of that, that I can truly present God as an all-powerful sovereign over all of their problems. And when we look at how we present Christ once again, and, and this being an evangelistic track, the Gospel of John, and how we passed out things, and, and sadly, I don't see anybody here that we passed anything out to, but... We're working on it. We're, we're, we're getting the pickaxe and working on the soil by keep passing these, these things out. We've passed out over a thousand of them. And we're just going to keep doing it till they're gone, or as, as Jeff said, until we can't walk anymore. We're going to keep doing it.
because God can change the heart. And if you come to somebody who says, yeah, I want to know about this, then in your, in your excitement, you can't forget what to say. You need to tell them about Jesus Christ. James Boyce wrote a book entitled, it was a book let, actually, The ABCs of Salvation. And he said that the first thing somebody has to do to enter the kingdom of God is they have to have an acceptance of the basic teachings of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John and Mark and Matthew and Luke did things and said things, and that needs to be accepted as true. This is a truth claim that Jesus is making that people need to accept. They need to understand and accept that the cross was a historical event, and they need to accept the teaching that they are a sinner in need of a Savior, and Jesus Christ is that Savior. And this is a big hurdle for a lot of people today because the way the world comes against the Bible is it calls it a fable, calls it a, a fantasy, a myth, something that was made up. Some people have said that the Bible itself was even written at, as late as 1820, that all these archaeological evidences of old Bibles are all made up, that it's a big conspiracy to control the population. But I think Christianity is the most uncontrolling religion that's out there. But they think it's there to control the population. And so people look at the Bible and think, yeah, it's good stories, but it's not true. Jonah was not swallowed by a fish. Moses did not split the Red Sea. Uh, all these things that happen in the Bible that are, that are great children's stories are also true stories. And a person coming to Christ must have an acceptance of these things as true, that the Bible presents a true story. Second, they have to believe it. And believing it means believing the meaning of it. They can't just say that Christ died on a cross. I believe that historically happened. But now they need to move into, I believe that his blood was an atonement for sin. I believe that I'm going to hell without that blood. I believe that I am lost and Christ is my Savior. Believing is getting the meaning behind the story. And that's why John picked those seven miracles, I think, because they have meanings behind the story that point to Jesus Christ. And then the final step, if you're walking somebody through what to do with Christ, is to commit. We will say that they asked Jesus into their heart, that they prayed and accepted Jesus. These phrases that we use are basically saying that I am committing to a life under Christ, that I recognize He's my Lord. You can even say I make Him my Lord and Savior, even though He already was already. But the idea is you're consciously moving yourself under the lordship of Christ and therefore into the kingdom of God. You do it first by accepting the truth claims of Scripture, by believing what they were put there to mean that your sin is going to send you to hell and the blood is the only way to get you saved. And third, you commit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And then at that point, if somebody did that, we would declare them saved. We would accept them as a brother or sister in Christ. Uh, the, the, the rocky soil does indicate that there is a time frame between joyfully accepting and falling away, which is why the Bible says you don't take new believers and put them into leadership. You watch them for a while. You bring them into the church. You accept them. You love them. But you make sure they're going to last, that they're not there just to enjoy the fellowship. And through knowing the gospel, through knowing how to pray for the different heart conditions that are out there, by knowing a handful of the seven, you don't have to memorize the seven miracles, just realize that Jesus did amazing things. 
then you can witness and you can pray. And you mostly pray. If you don't pray before you specifically witness to somebody, then you, you have no clue what condition their heart is in. But if you pray for God to change their heart so that they'll listen to you, and then you try, and then you pray some more, and you pray some more, and you pray some more, and you try again. And we know that individuals who are out there are being hit on all sides by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how God works. He is throwing the word of God out there and people are being hit by something they hear on the TV or some letter, the advertisement they got or somebody that put a hanger on their door and little by little, their heart is chipping away. And if we pray, then the Holy Spirit can precede us and in doing so, change their heart into good soil so that finally when we say, do you wish to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, they say, yes, what do I do? And then you have them pray, and you give them a Gospel of John, because that's the one we do. We tell people what John said, because that gets them into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if we continue to do this, the ABCs of salvation, cover it with prayer, then we can convert a few, maybe a lot, of San Lorenzo and increase the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just praise you that people can be saved, that even today the gospel is true, the gospel is active, the gospel is moving people into the kingdom of God, and we praise you for that. I pray that we will not be scared, that we will not be weak, but we will be willing when somebody says something to us to give the proper answer, that in giving the proper answer we can move them, ABC, into the kingdom of God. Lord, we praise you for that and ask your blessing upon this day. We ask this through the blood of Christ. Amen.